Hi, my name is Dinny. This is the third episode of my podcast called My Imperfect Knitting Life. It's been an absolute pleasure doing the last two podcasts and I have, again, really enjoyed great feedback from people. I really don't want to overthink this process too much and I just want to be able to share stuff with you about my knitting. So that's the things that I've done, things that I'm going to do, and also about my spinning mill and a little bit about my life. So I will just get on with it because... I can't really rehearse this very much and I don't want to do a lot of editing. So here we go. The first thing is um, we've now reached spring. So I know that a lot of in the Northern Hemisphere, you're all going into autumn and loving the leaves, but here it's springtime. And for me, that means magnolias, beautiful, beautiful magnolias. They've actually bloomed and they're starting to get their leaves, lots of blossom and the clematis is about to come out. And I really love this time of year. Also driving through town, Rotorua, it's not a very big population, I think about 65,000 people. Um, this time of year is tulip time to me. And when you're driving through town, through the roundabouts and around, you see heaps and heaps of tulips, which the council put in. And I've taken a couple of pictures of that, which I'll show at the end of the video, but it really is a lovely, lovely time. Um, the other thing with uh, spring is lots of rain. So rain is great for the garden, but it's also not so great for the roads. And um, we've been having a lot of troubles on the roads. Um, it, you know, communities get cut off when the roads are down because we don't have lots of big highways like a bigger countries. A lot of our roads are used by the trucks and the cars and there's single lane with little bits where you can pass each other and that's actually for a huge part of um, New Zealand um, and at the moment there's a lot of rain and a lot of um, potholes and bits and pieces so having to deal with all of that. On the plus side for the rain, Roger my husband got the um, rain tank all connected up from the roof of the, the shed where the mill's going to go and so when it's raining now, I'm like, yay, uh, how much rainwater am I going to have for the summer in my tank? And that's very exciting. Um, and I'm going to need that for the mill, going to need it for the garden. And, you know, we might end up with sort of semi-drought um, going on here. But even if we don't, we pay for our water and I feel like it's future-proofing. So I'm very happy that it's all set up. Now, I think what I'll first talk about in terms of knitting is what I'm wearing. So this is um, another kind of made up, but partially used with another pattern. So it's knitted in yarn and um, it's another little short sleeve, which you know I love. So it's a raglan construction, top down. And I have a funny feeling that this actually started off as a with a stitch count from a children's pattern. But anyway, um, I started off with that and I've used one strand of knitted in and one strand of silk and then just taken it to where I feel is a good place to make the body. And then once I've got to the body, you put the sleeves onto a holder and then you just knit everything round and round and round until you get to the length that you want. But what I did add in there is that magnolia pattern that I used on the other tops um, that I showed you in my previous episodes. So I really like that a little magnolia pattern and then into that twisted rib. And then I like the cropped length. Again, knitted in yarn, no idea what the color is. And the silk I'll also have to look up because it... I don't even know what it is. It was all just wrapped in a ball. I tried to make a scarf for somebody and then that didn't seem to be very nice. So I just rolled it up and put it back in the in, into the basket. Um, but I will put the notes on the show notes so you know what's, what's what of anything that I find. So um, yeah, that's what I'm wearing. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my finished objects. So... This is the little top that I was making for Freddie. 
and um, that's the one where it's knitted in the flat and then I explained how that was all put together the thing I wasn't too sure about last time remember was the sleeves and I did go for the green in fact anyone who commented said no the green was the better one and I totally agreed I'd already made my mind up I was going to do that and so I finished it off and I think it's super and I've already put it on Freddie but I feel mean because I kept it back so I could show you guys and I will again put the pattern and the fat the yarn that I used in the notes and I will drop it off with Freddie and in fact I think I've got a couple of pictures of her wearing it at the end so I'll pop those in too I'm just going to check with her parents that that's okay what's next I feel like I'm whizzing through that all the knitting this time probably a good thing because I do want to talk to you about the mill and give you an update of what's happening there but let me do a quick change Claire Marie's top is finished so I'll just show you what that looks like right um, if you remember I explained to you my first episode about how the sleeves were really loose and that I would have to redo those so I've done that now and I'm very happy with the finished product I mean I know if my sister looked at this she'd be pointing out how the lines are not matching but to be perfectly honest I am happy with it it's fine it's not perfect and I think Claire Marie is going to be absolutely stoked when I bring that over this week and she can wear it so yay and you know what? I'm going to wear it for the rest of this little chat with you because I like it. And I have, I have actually started for myself in my whips basket um, the same yarn because when I bought the yarn for this top, I thought buy an extra ball because there'll be no going back if you don't have enough wool. And then also I discovered that it hardly used any of the balls. I think for the whole of this top, it used three, maybe not even three of these whole scarn balls. And um, so I've got loads left, two and a half. And I have started myself a little top. And guess what? It's going to be either short sleeved, because this is lovely next to the skin, and I've used the same neck and the same increasing and then I'm going to probably take it short sleeved fitted and I might actually take it beyond the elbow but I don't want it long sleeve I want that opportunity to wear it in warmer weather as well so yeah it's going to be mine and if it doesn't fit me I will give it to somebody else the only thing is so far that I picked up, I dropped a stitch. So now, yeah, several rows down. And normally I would be going to my sister, Millie, help. But now I think I need to get my big girl knitting pants on and just YouTube it and find out how just to bring it up. I'm pretty sure I can do it. I'm just probably a little bit lazy. When you've got somebody who will save you, it's so much easier to ask somebody else to do it for you. So I will keep you posted on what this turns out to be. Because I was actually, in my mind, thinking I could actually do some colour work on the sleeve or I could do some colour work at the waist. But mm, knowing me, I'll keep it simple because simple's fine. It's the feel of the fabric and the colour. So I'll be very happy when I finish that. Yeah, it's going to be really nice. The other thing that's um, a work in progress is my Utivist. Oh, I am actually have to take this top, top off because I would like to show you what I've done on the Utivist so far. So... For those of you who haven't seen the other episodes, I did talk about it on episode one and two, and I will briefly show you the schematic. 
because that will show you where I'm at. But the Utavist is knitted from the bottom upwards. It's made out of an unspun yarn. It's Plotulopi yarn. And I've actually found it quite not hard on my hands, but yeah, a little bit sore um, if, to, to knit for long periods. And I think it's because it's quite thick and also because it's double and it's on a fat needle. So let me just show you what's happened so far. So remember, I've done all of the shaping. Oh, I'm going to do that so you can see. Yeah, I'm into the waist now. So it is a jacket, so it's not tight fitting, and I need to be able to get things underneath. I might have to take you take it off and show you, but that's where the sticking is. And I've done the waist shaping in, and now I'm going to start doing the waist shaping out to the chest. Oh, what's happening with my top? It's annoying. Oops. What's really annoying is the top said it was a XXXL, and yet it sort of does that thing here never mind all right i'm going to put Kimmy's top back on again because it's comfy and i'm going to have to give it back to her so that is the back cool all right let me show you on the utavist what's going on if you're looking for a nice clean edit straightforward video this might not be the one for you um but I'm just going to talk to you as though you're here with me and hopefully you enjoy it still. So what I've done is I've actually done right up until this waistband bit here. So I've done decreases that do the waist shaping and now I'm going to start doing some increases up to the armpit. And at the same time you have to do the pockets. So what I'll show you again is that steeked bit at the front, which is basically two pearls, and then you just keep knitting in the round, which I like, because I think it's a little bit quicker when you just knit, 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 knit. What I have also decided is I don't want, I actually don't want it with the, I don't want the flower on the head. I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna do that detail on the yoke and have a plain hood that's just not my cup of tea so it's not going to happen all righty so again i will put the notes in terms of where you can get this pattern um it's by helen magnuson where you can what kind of wool it uses or yarn it uses and um and show you that so that's basically my whoops all my whoops and my actual just finished ob objects of stuff that i've been doing since i started the podcast so what i think i will do again is show you another thing that i made previously and unfortunately this is very old but it's I suppose for me it's really so significant in that if you think about things too much or you think something's really hard, you can't always do it, where you kind of get yourself in a headspace, whereas if you kind of jump in and just keep going, you can actually do something. So I would not say, when I did this jersey, I was not a very either prolific or experienced knitter. So when my youngest boy was about 10 months old, my sister and I went on holiday to Norway. At the time I was living in South Africa. So he was 10 months old. My sister and I went for six weeks. We went and stayed with our, our sister in Norway. And whilst I was there, I wanted to um, start knitting this jersey or get a jersey that I could knit for my husband. And I've always loved Norwegian fair isle patterns. I don't even call it. Do they call it fair all over there but you know um color work that's it color work and i picked a very traditional style i think with the viking ships on and then they're not called fleas i think those things are fleas but some very traditional patterns and it was a, you know a reasonable amount of money for me then and i got all of that packed up took it home 
the main thing was that the pattern was in Norwegian and I did not speak Norwegian. So I asked my sister to translate it and she translated the first bit and then I had to wait quite a while, I think, before the next bit was done. And um, I just started working my way through it. And now when I look even at the back, I'm like, I can't believe I did that. It took probably about three years on and off, but that was because for about eight months, it was actually in transit from South Africa to New Zealand. And I don't even know, he would never have been able to wear this in South Africa. It's heavy, it's thick. Um, but basically, I'll talk a little bit about the construction. So it starts at the bottom. You knit it from the bottom upwards in the round, following a chart. That bit was fairly easy. So, you know, I didn't need too much translation for that. But once you get to the sleeves, then you do the steeked portion. Um, so that you can cut up there and inset the sleeves. This thing is huge on him now. Hey, he's much chunkier then. And then you do that all the way up to the neck. And I literally cannot remember how I did the neck, but I do remember that this bit here was grafted. So, you know, again, for somebody who had no idea what to do, I actually don't think that was too bad. I mean, it would have been like maybe 30. I don't know, not a lot of knitting experience at all at that point. And then it's a stretchy neck. How did I do that? I've got no idea. Once, never done that again. And then what you do when you do the steaking, as I did see inside, there's lots of zigzag um, sewing. So I sewed it with a sewing machine. And then you cut up the steaking and then you, there was this little piece here, see all that garter stitch there, that's like a flap. So you sew the sleeve underneath and then you put the this bit over the top and then you sort of slip stitch, sew it invisibly so you can't see how you finished it. But, you know, I made that with basically no experience. I haven't even done, I don't even think I've done proper colour work since then. But pretty proud of that. And even if he only wears it once a year, those are the sorts of things that even in Norway get handed down within families. And um, that's not, no, that's like a superwash, which is more modern. Whereas I've actually bought some Norwegian jerseys on eBay or Trade Me or whatever. Um, and they've been a much coarser wool and I think that's probably more traditional it would have been more local sheep and definitely not superwash but you need to be really careful you don't felt that I've only washed that thing a couple of times over the years because it's wool it doesn't need washing all the time um, do you air wash your do you air wash your woolens because I do try and do that now instead of washing them frequently I put them on a hanger and then I take them outside and just hang them out in the air um, and then that sort of refreshes them put them away and then maybe once a year you have to wash them if if it's close to your skin but shouldn't need washing very often at all um, and that's something that I think a lot of people seem to think they need to keep washing woolens especially baby's woolens if you get a little bit of milk on you just put it in the sun and then when it dries you just like flick it off crust it off and then you just air wash it uh, and then occasionally you know three four times a year maybe just give it a gentle wash and shampoo or a, a wool wash so yeah I'm pretty proud of that and can't believe that I did that I had to wait for my sister to send me the translation of it now, the next thing I want to talk about is my mum. So I mentioned that my mum has some of my some knitting and has uh, uh, is someone who's taught me knitting. But she's 88 years old and she has glaucoma and um, macular degener degenerative disease of her eyes and is basically, well, she's definitely legally blind and she has... Her sight is sort of where she can't see in the middle. She sort of notices more of the periphery. 
but she still manages to knit. She's 88, still knitting. So she uh, has made things for lots of things for the grandchildren or her great grandchildren. And this is one of the things that she knitted with a little dress. Now the dress is with Sophie, but the little hat was just a little bit too small for her. Um, but yeah, my blind 88 year old mother, and I'm gonna get her on one day and have a little chat with her while you, so you can meet her, um, made that. And she's very, very clever. She also, that, remember the first wool from the mill when we went over with Julie? That was some of the wool. I've got some, I haven't, haven't actually done my bit with it, but she made this little bolero top for Sophie. And I mean, honestly, can you just see how soft and scrunchy that yarn is? So soft. So proud of that. Such a clever mama. So what I'll do is um, she's going to send me the name of the website that she got this. I'm sure it was a free pattern. Um, and I will put that on the notes for you. I think also those little buttons make it super cute too. She said it should have had a button underneath, but I think it's, you know, like one to secure it, the third one. I might put that on just to make her happy, but I don't really think it needs it. So that's mum's stuff over there. Now, I do have an update for the mill. And you, I'm sure you can tell just by my face that it's probably not the best news. So the mill was going to come on Wednesday. But I got a call from the, the Carter guy, uh, Rich, and he told me that uh, his truck had broken down and he couldn't do it that day. So I was like, I was actually surprised because I thought maybe he just would have other stuff that needed to be done first. Um, but he said that he wanted to do it Monday, which is tomorrow. Um, and the forecast has been rain, rain, rain every single day, Monday included, all the way till Thursday. Thursday and Friday of next week is the first non-rainy day kind of expected and I really wanted him to try and delay it to the Friday but he can't do that because he's relying on somebody else for their truck and in fact he's bringing two trucks so that he can get all of the bins and all the shelves and all the other bits that have to come over as well so it's going to be tomorrow again Fingers crossed, because if the roads are terrible and he can't get through or something happens to that truck, then it's going to be delayed again. So I'm really sorry to tell you that, but we've definitely had progress on the mill, the shed over the hill. And I'm going to put some pictures up at the end of our little chat today and show you that. The other thing that might be a problem is he might be able to pick the 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 machines up but when you come through our property and go over the little hill I know that we've had other trucks have trouble get over the hill so I'm not too sure if he's going to make it over the hill he did tell me that if he can't do that he will take the machines into town and store them and then as soon as the weather's good then he'll bring them out here and so I'm just trying to be open and not overly worried but I am a little bit worried especially with the rain because I don't think machines and rain go very well and the carding machine is my biggest concern so with the carder each of the rollers has got well it's like a card and attached to the little little wee tines they're called tines but that's what cards the wool and if that gets wet and damaged, it's going to be a massive job to replace those. In fact, I don't even know who I would talk to about replacing those. So I'm getting a little bit stressed about keeping them dry and getting them onto the truck. But I can't deal with that until I get there. So I'm going to um, sort that out when... When we're there and if i'm really worried i will express my concerns but can't be too anal i'll just have to trust that he knows what he's doing um i've had a lot of interest from many of you about the mill and um 
when I've talked to people here about it, they often think it's like a spinning wheel and that it's, you know, they don't realise how big it is. Although it didn't look so big when I, when I went to see Julie on Friday. It, uh, I was with all of the bins out of the way and all the fleece. I was like, oh, it's not as big as I thought. Maybe it's not going to be as big a job as I thought getting it moved over. But we'll see. Um, but anyway, a lot of people don't understand what actually happens that takes your the wool or the fleece and all the different processes to get it into a yarn at the end and when i first got the machines i actually drew this so you know me in my famous drawings i drew this to try and explain the process to to, to people because they would be like what exactly are you doing so i just wonder if you would like me to go through that so i can't even see it properly so okay here we are I'm going to go through it so this is it in its entirety so excuse my excuse my drawings the first one is you've got your sheep and once you get your sheep you have to shear your sheep and the you know the farmers need to shear the sheep to keep them cool in this in the summer so there you go sheared sheep and then you get your wool coming through and what you need to do before it goes to the mill is you need to clean out all the crappy bits, all the bits that have got poop on and the shortcuts that are not going to go through the um, machines and stuff like that. Because when it comes to the mill, whatever comes in gets weighed and whatever's weighed is what the person getting the fleece um, done, they pay for that. So the person sending it in should really try and take as much of the rubbishy bits off so that they're not paying for something that's not going to be done once it's skirted that's the technical term skirting once it's skirted it then goes into a tumbler and in the tumbler a lot of the poop and the vegetation will be tumbled out so that looks like and i'll show you that because when it's working i'll take you down and show you what everything is doing that tumbles out the poop and the vegetation and it all falls out of the bottom so Julie said, you know, that stuff at the bottom, you can take that, you can put that in your compost, it'll go back into the environment. And um, from there, you're then going to take it and you're going to wash the fleece. So I've bought secondhand um, laundry tubs and I'm going to be doing it like that. So I've seen some very flash machines that have done it on other podcasts in the States, but I don't have that so I'm just using what I've got permaculture life and all that and I'm going to use my rainwater where I can but to start with it's not even going to be down by the shed it's going to be up here by the house and then from there you wash it and then you're going to dry it on a rack so I've got lots of racks and I'll and as I say when it comes I'll show you exactly how that's all done and then from that, if I want to dye it, and I'm pretty sure I'm going to try and do some tweedy wools. So I'll use some natural colours, but in that I'm going to put some dyed colours and get different, more kind of muted, I suppose, not so bright, muted yarns that I'm going to experiment with. So if I'm dyeing it, that's when I would dye it. So I've got a massive big pot and I feel like I'm going to be maybe building... A little wood fire underneath it if i can if i can't do a wood fire because i've got heaps of wood on the property that i can use then i will use gas burner or something like that so i can't even see what that is i need to have a look oh yeah it's dried again so the wool gets dried again and then there's a machine called a picker so you, you sort of put that fleece onto the picker and it goes through and, well, does what it says, picks it out, flicks it, makes it light. And then it sort of woofs it through a little system of um, sucky thing and then spits it out into uh, a little room. And that sort of looks like candy floss or fluffy floss stuff. Um, and it's in a cupboard. And so from there, I'll take it onto the carding machine. So 
when it the fluff gets put onto a flat tray it goes through the different rollers and then you've actually got it the other way around but it ends up coiling into a bucket and that definitely looks like candy floss it's very cool so once it's been carded then it goes onto the pinning machine so all right what's the pinning machine the pinning machine basically straightens all the fibers because the more straight the fibers are the better the yarn that you can produce the more even the yarn and you'll put it through the pinning machine maybe three times um and the reason why you would want to put it through the pinning machine three times is the straighter the thinner you get a feel for what's oh i don't even know i'm talking rubbish there so let's go past this you pin it and then after that it goes on to the spinning machine so this for me is currently my nightmare i have struggled to get the things put up but i'm working on it anyway you put it onto the spinner you first spin it into a single thread and then from there you ply it so plying is when you're putting two threads or three threads together it sort of reverses and makes your yarn and that's the yarn that you get and then from there you steam it you put it into skeins or you put it onto a cone and the steaming will set the um set the wool and that's what you get as a finished product so you know when you see a commercial yarn you can imagine it they've just got massive machines and there's loads and loads and loads of it going through at one go and it becomes quite cost effective for them to do but when you're doing this what i call artisan type production you are taking a lot of time it takes time to wash the wool you've got to dry it then from there you know you're moving it into different places there's a lot of hands-on work and then hours of watching it go through different processes you know pinning takes time and if you've got a, a fleece that's not in very good condition it is tricky i mean i just i know that from when we worked on the alpaca you know julie would say oh this one's a not such an easy one and you're like oh well i'm learning and it's not such an easy one so let's hope when i get onto sheep yarn or sheep fleece it's going to be a little bit easier than that anyway so maybe what you know when you look at this this was actually i said that brown one was our first one but the very first thing we did the first day was putting this through the pinning machine i think it had already been carded and then trying to put it on the spinning machine i was not very good at that but my friend judy was much better so hopefully judy remembers how to do it and she's going to show me i think what added to it, to it was that i was nervous and i was just really aware that this was julie's fleece and when you don't actually get it up what happens is so you're not having fleece all over the place it goes into this little sucky thing and then into a big bin and um I'm pretty sure the first day she said that we actually wasted 60% of the actual fleece went into the bin. Um, on the plus side, we did get that back in that second lot of um, brown yarn that I showed you. Um, and with that one, I think we only had like a 30% waste or something. So it was much better. Um, we would kind of got the hang of it a little bit more um, that time so that is how fleece is made and when the mill's going i will show you each of those things individually on little videos and things if you're interested i'm just not really sure whether to do that separately to this video you know to this sort of podcast or to just incorporate it like i'm doing um i don't really want to be spending hours and hours at each podcast i want so when something comes up and i've got something to talk about that i can do a podcast and that might be a week but actually if there's not a lot to talk about it might be three weeks and i'm going to share also my frustrations with learning because we all have that i just don't want to be showing you oh look how wonderful this is or how well that went real learning means you've got to just keep making mistakes sometimes until you get it right and 
that's a real lesson in life it's so easy to show your little instagram life with all those wonderful things but actually reality is if you want to learn something you've got to a put yourself out there b put the work in it doesn't happen by mistake yes you might have a talent for something but even people who don't have a natural talent can learn to do things and get a lot of joy out of it and i want to be able to show all of that what's and all i might even be like boohooing a few times well probably not um i'll save that for my poor husband <laughs> or my family because they seem to get it but i'm not definitely not going to smooth over those difficult bits um something else that i wondered whether i would sort of share with you today was a lot of people have commented and complimented me on the fact that i don't stick to a pattern or that i'm you know asking me how i do different things um but sometimes i just feel that things organically will happen as they go and if you have a have that mindset you need to have that one thing that is exactly as the picture says that's when i found i've been disappointed because it either doesn't look right on me or i haven't got the yarn that they're using so it's never going to look like it does in the picture and a real game changer for me was doing top down because when you do a top down construction you can fit things as you go along all right so you can see what something looks like you can see if the shoulder feels okay and if you get to this point and it's not right you can take it back a little bit and then um you know yes maybe the pattern says long sleeve but hey i'm happy with the short sleeve i'm going to do a short sleeve and I really want to encourage you all to just give things a go. My friend Maureen, she wants to learn to knit in the circular and I will show her. But you know what? There are so many tutorials on YouTube showing you all of the stuff that you'll be able to find it and just give it a go. But I do like sharing my stuff with you. So hopefully it's not too boring. Um, the one person, there was a person... Uh, whose channel I watched who really made me feel a lot more confident about doing things um, my way was Miss Evil Knits and if you have time I would encourage you to perhaps look at her 10 sessions on creativity they were really really good um, so basically what she does she really tries to put you off in the first um, session she will really try and put you off watching the video. I chuckled and chuckled because she does not want to answer questions. She doesn't want to give you a, a pattern or a recipe. That's not why she's doing it. And basically, if she's not getting anything out of this, she's not even going to continue the 10 sessions that she thought she might do. She does actually finish them all. and um, But in each of those sessions, she gets you to think about what you want out of your knitting, what you want to create, how you want to create. She explains her process of how she creates things and does stuff. And it's I found it really, really interesting. It's not something, for some people you might go, oh, it's a bit heavy, but if you're happy to just sit for an hour or so and absorb it and then maybe wait a week or two before you go into the next one, you would find it might find it really helpful as well. Um, other things that helped me in my journey, and this is quite a few years back, so I, I think what I found was a lot of patterns didn't work or fit for me, and so I kind of got into looking at people who did things a little bit differently. And so, obviously, Elizabeth Zimmerman, she's a big one. Elizabeth Zimmerman's books, where you're learning to knit in the round. Um, she does patterns where she uses mathematical... And that's me lost mathematical stuff like the pie shawl. Um, but knitting in the round, that was really useful. And this lady here, Barbara Walker, she explains all these different little techniques. And then if you want to do a drop shoulder, how you do a sleeve for a drop, drop shoulder. Or if you want to have a little wee um, puff sleeve, how to make that. So there's lots of books that will show you those things. And if you kind of want that more given to you, this lady here stephanie Japel. sorry that's my it's in case i lent it to somebody my midwife um label 
So Stephanie Japel, she does some amazing fitted knits. And, you know, if you get your gauge right, you can definitely do some beautiful knitting. So there's all sorts of things that you can try um, in there. So I just want to reflect a little bit about what this process has been like for me. I've absolutely enjoyed it. I have had hundreds of comments and I honestly, please don't be offended. I, I haven't got time to reply to all of them. I've got loads on. And, but I have read every single one and I've really acknowledged that with a, a little like. Um, so that you know that I have read it and I would at some point probably be happy to do a QA and a if that's what you want um, and there are times I am going to answer little things that people have said but I'm not going to reply to every message but thank you thank you thank you so much for all of those one thing that did come up I'm going to say this this is going to be a much longer video than the others was um, someone commented on my plant and said oh I love your euphorbia and I was like Ding! because what actually happened was I didn't know it was a euphorbia I see there's a little stick in it now that tells me that but last night a friend of ours came for dinner and he told me about his sister in England and he said that she had ended up with burns on her arms and some burns on her face um, and she gets these little sores that come up all the time and it was from a euphorbia and he thought, wow, that's a bit weird. So he looked it up on uh, Google. And yes, the sap on a euphorbia apparently is quite toxic and can give you a really bad rash. So now I'm a little bit nervous about the plant. I feel like it should go into isolation or something. And if I ever, because I'm about to do a whole repotting of the pot plants, I will be wearing gloves and I will not touch it. In fact, I might be wearing goggles too because it looks like a particularly dangerous plant now. It's funny how something that was just completely innocuous before is a threat, but we'll see. I'm gonna do some planting this week. Um, I have not got all of my plants in and some of them are growing out of the bottom of the seedling tray and I just need to be able to get out into the garden and get that done. I kind of wish I had a woofer here or something. That would be really useful. I need a willing slave. My poor husband, though, he's been the willing slave down at the shed. And um, and so, yeah, I need to go and get those things done. And thank you very much for tuning in again if you have. And keep those comments coming because I love reading them. I really love seeing where you live and what you do and what your interests are. And um, it's never boring. Love it, love it. If you do want to subscribe to my channel, please do that and give me a thumbs up if you can. I'm going to try and get the little banner that somebody suggested that's, that says all of that. And I look forward to seeing you next time. And hopefully, please, we've got a mill and there'll be pictures. I've got to tell you, I'm going to be putting pictures at the end of the video of the, the shed when it was just... A really crappy old little shed and sort of the changes because even I've forgotten what it was like and what it's like now just how much work's gone into that and I also need to say a very big thank you to my husband but also my son Dean who's a builder he really did not have the time has a million of things he wants to do in his own house and he still came over and helped me because my builder could not do it and I'm very, very grateful, Dean. Thank you so much for coming over. I know there's still a few more things that need to be done. and But, you know, the actual guts of getting the machines in, that work is done. And I'm very grateful. The other boys did come and help as well. So that was James and um, Jonathan. They did come and help. They, you know, every little hour, every bit of help has been so gratefully received. And I can't wait to have a party when it's all in. In fact, I want to have a big paella party because Rogers makes an amazing paella and I'll show you a little video of that. So see you next time and thanks very much. Bye.
down there is the shed.